Welcome everyone to the 29th Salon of the Maternal Gift Economy Breaking Through. Hosted by the International Feminists for the Gift Economy. I'm Leticia Layson. I'll be your moderator. Um, we still have two speakers that will be joining us as soon as they uh, arrive, but we can get started. Um, today we're, we plan to have Starhawk, who will do a meditation when she arrives, Jody Evans, Vandana Shiva, and Kelly Curry, who is also on her way. So right now that we have Jody and Vandana with us, I'm going to read their bios, and then I'm going to just hand it off to Jody. All right. So Jody is a lifelong peace and social justice activist and co-founder of Code Pink, Women for Peace, and was Jerry Brown's was in Jerry Brown's cabinet when he served as governor for California in the 1970s. She founded a campaign at Code Pink, cultivating a local peace economy to address the needs of ch to change culture from a war economy culture to a peace economy culture. If we want to achieve, achieve peace and justice, that's what we'll need to do. We want to change it to a giving, sharing, caring, thriving, relational economy from an extractive, destructive, and oppressive economy. Vandana Shiva was trained as a physicist. She has saved seeds. And right now she's calling in from a remote area in India. Thank you for staying up to be with us. And um, after two years, she was in lockdown. This is the first time that she's been able to travel and she can tell you a little bit more about what she's doing there. She shifted to really support the planet and has written many, many books. You can look at our website maternalgifteconomy.org so that you can see their full bios. But right now, let's have a dialogue with these two. And as Starhawk and Kelly arrive, they'll be uh, brought into the conversation. So Jody, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone from all over the world, I see. I'm, I'm coming from Tonga occupied land on the west coast of Turtle Island. And I just wanna thank Leticia, Diane, Liliana and Jen for holding this space where we can come together and share. It's uh, such a sacred space for me and I've appreciated it um, over the last few years. It must be almost two years. So here we are in the fog of war. Um, a reminder that this is, uh, you know, uh, a time that we've known before, um, but it's a place that has affected each of us in a different way, and, and I hope we get to that, but it's also the place where I say that all the practice that we've done uh, to be in the gifting peace economy all the ways we've recognized the violence of the cultural patterns that the war economy forces us into that we break um, and all the ways that we are in the space of mothering, of giving, uh, the gifting peace economy, the giving, sharing, caring, thriving, relational, resilient economy without which none of us would be alive. Um, how do we meet this moment in history, this moment in time from the place of those values? Even as I know many of us, our hearts are breaking, uh, it, it arises fear, we are driven by the news to hate. Um, how do we step out of that when we know uh, everything we read is a lie, um, especially in the fog of war because we've been you know, I don't know everyone at the age, but it wasn't that long ago that the war in Afghanistan ended, um, war on Afghanistan ended. So we know that the information we receive is distorted. 
We know the media uses it to drive separation and hate all values that don't fit in uh, the gifting peace economy. So um, today I thought together we would explore um, how to be in this time together. Um, the first is that um, it forces us to uh, react um, instead of um, engage. So um, the first thing we can do is engage. And here we are engaging. And so the first off is um, Jen, Letitia, and Diane model what to do for us. And that is to create space for a community to come together, to share our feelings and hold our hearts in our hands. It's best done in person. And yet this, this works and is super valuable. But you know, one thing you can do after we're together this today is to go and create this space to model Jen and the team and do it yourself. And that means with another person, with three other person, people with just an inviting a community and see what shows up. But in this moment, it's to recognize that everyone is going to be driven to a reaction. And so engagement um, can be, you know, your response, your gift to the moment. War opens Pandora's box and it's a fog for everyone. You know, think about when you're in an argument and you think you're irrational, but you were being irrational to the other person as your needs are colliding. Well, here we are again with a few men driving the world mad, creating more fear and hate, anxiety and trauma. Um, I have a, you know, there's a fighter pilot from World War II um, who said war is a place where young people who don't know each other and don't hate each other kill each other by the decision of old people who know each other and hate each other, but don't kill each other. So, you know, we're watching, a, we're watching patterns. We're watching the US use Russia, you know, use another country to get at Russia. So once it was Afghanistan and now it's Ukraine and we're watching young men give their lives and innocent women and children. That is heartbreaking. It's also a Pandora's box that when it is over, does something to change the world. The last 20 years have been the war on terror. The United States taxpayers have spent $20 trillion on that. And I wanna say that it has also changed the culture of the world and the culture of the country I live inside of because it does create a culture of hate, a culture of separation, a culture of violence. And, you know, no matter, it's like Congress voting more weapons for war, weapons only kill people. They do not end wars. What ends wars are conversations, are listening. Another tenant of the gifting peace economy, listening. So it's one of the things that we can do now. It is not a time to argue with people. We're in the fog of war. There is nothing anybody outside of those three men can do to stop this. They need to sit at a table. They need to each give up something. They need to come to an agreement. We, we, our job as gifting peace economy, uh, I call us tuning forks, is to be the tensile strength of that tuning fork in this moment, because we are grounded in love and peace and gifting. We are grounded in a truth that brings life to this world instead of the, the lies of war that take life away, not just of people, but of the planet. There is nothing more violent or more that contributes more to climate change than war. So our role is to be that tuning fork and to show up in these moments with our grounding so that we can um, help those that get sucked into uh, literally the suck of war and the fog of war and help them find clarity and peace in their own hearts um, so that more don't get sucked in than are already are. 
um, because then we can be the center of love, you know, instead of how the media and everything else is pulling people into fear. And so that those around us can find the place to respond instead of react. So they can feel what their hearts need to feel in this moment, which is grief, which is a lot of sadness and find the way they want to react. And I, you know, it's, I love, I'm looking forward to Starhawk being here. I, I saw, I was with her last week, you know, Starhawk's response is a blessing, is a prayer. And, you know, it's like the, to, to be able to be that person that can be in a community that takes us to the place of the sacred, the sake of the place where we, we hold in our hearts those that are at the effects of war, which there's nothing more brutal or ugly. And we don't need to watch the news. The other thing is take yourself off the news. When, there, when peace is arisen, you will know. But the news is there to create distortion, hate, and lies, and um, fear. You don't need it. You then need to be the, 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 the space where people find wisdom instead of lies. And so you can play that out. And, and, and in the way Starhawk in her blessing grounds us and you know, brings us back into ourselves and into our hearts and into where we need to be, to even be of gift in this moment, to be the gift because it will take us into what is our offering. Um, the few other things that, you know, the war economy, you know, does, it separates, right? It's like if the absurdity of this moment is, is the media relating to Putin like he's Hitler and um, Zelensky like he's Superman. And Biden seems to be out of it. Instead of there are three people at a table and um, we need to see them rationally. When the world is irrational, be rational. It's like three people with needs that aren't getting their needs met. And um, all we can do is say, go to the table and talk. Go to the table and talk. So um, we can't let ourselves be in separation. And, and it's a big part of it. You know, I know STARS prayer is to be in communion with all. That when someone says we need to send more weapons, your answer is weapons kill people. No, no, uh, we, I will not raise my child to kill another mother's child. I will not send a weapon because it will kill another mother's child. So we know the answers, um, super simple and clear. And, um, you know, the other thing, Thing that the work on me does is it, it tries to limit our thinking. And so when we can get in that, that space, we can get into our imagination because the limiting of our thinking dulls our imagination and it's where we wanna be right now. We wanna be in, uh, as Yoko Ono um, put um, giant billboards across the world, imagine peace. I invite us to follow Yoko's response to this moment which was to remind us to imagine peace, to feel the, 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 the sinews of space with imagination and peace instead of like the barrage of war and hate. And, you know, also that um, the war economy, you know, restrains us and puts us in ways that we need to be. And, and everyone, I'm, you know, I watch it in, in Congress right now of everyone thinking they have to be warmongers. And my, you know, response to restraint is pleasure and joy. And so in this moment where our hearts are breaking, where we're watching a moment in history live that we know will change things, to remember that um, the, our hearts and our souls and our spirits rely on pleasure and beauty. And that is not a sacrilege in this moment, that is a necessity. So there's so many more, but um, I just wanted to start us into this moment and ask Vandana to, to share her, how she is um, responding to this moment and how 
all the tools that she shares with us and all the ways she creates seeds and life with her life what are what are how do those how does how can she give us those tools to respond to this moment thank you so much jody and thank you jen and diane and leticia um i've always believed that keeping going and persistence is part of the gift economy um not we're not rushing through because there's a new passion to chase, but because there's permanence of loving and giving that um, I, I loved your, your phrase uh, about being the tensile strength of the tuning forks. Um, yeah, and, and I relate to that also because, you know, my physics teaching me the whole world is about the creativity of resonance. It is about vibrations that are not in discordance but in harmony. That's ecology, it's as simple as that. From the molecule to the cell, to the organism, to the planet, to the universe. And we are the tuning forks because we've not forgotten life. Uh, I am joining you and I'm happy, very happy that I was able to join you, I wasn't sure, because I am traveling to one part of the country where uh, 25 years ago, we started to respond to two things, you know, for about since 1984, I've been responding to war in food and farming. I didn't realize it was there. I was busy doing quantum theory, but I'd done my MSc honors in particle physics in Punjab University, and 84, it was erupting. And I did a study for the United Nations called the violence of the Green Revolution. And I studied then that so much of technology in our time, just called technology without description are actually war technologies. Yeah. So every ingredient of what's called the green revolution or industrial agriculture imposed on the third world comes from the war. Synthetic fertilizers, original design explosives, pesticide, original design kill people, poison gas, like one B. Uh, and even, even in fisheries, you know, so much, the, the bottom trawling, these things that catch fish loads and throw half of it away. Trawls were originally designed for looking for mines in the ocean floor. So bottom trawlers are another war technology. And you can just identify this. So I found this out when I did that study and I took a pledge. Then I'm going to work on looking for, I didn't know what it would be, looking for, a, uh, an ecology of peace, uh, making peace with the earth, a nonviolent farming. And I've been teaching myself this since 1984. And then there was this new war, they called it a trade war between intellectual property and primitive seeds in the world that are empty. And I said, no, there's, no, there's nothing like empty life. All life is full of fibers, it's full of vibration. It is full of renewal and regeneration. So I was anyway doing nonviolent farming and I started to save seeds. And in this area of India, a place called Orissa today, used to be called Utkal, Kalinga. Uh, it's the part of India, if you look at the map, it's the Eastern part of India, the Bay of Bengal, which had amazing relationships with all of Asia. And if you look at you know, the ways of, of clothing, et cetera, in Indonesia, there's a one-to-one -one map. But there's another way my being in Orissa uh, is it's so relevant to today's dialogue because it was here that Emperor Ashok, one of our very famous emperors, was part of a war called the Kalinga War. And he, he was part of the bloodshed, but he saw the bloodshed. And then he started to say, this cannot be the way forward. And he then turned to Buddhism as a religion of peace and became Buddhist and spread Buddhism all over. It's not that dominant in India, but you will still find in my valley, in Dune Valley, in where I live, uh, there's a Ashoka pillar. And that constantly he's reminding people to make peace with the earth, plant trees. And he's telling people that everyone is one network of sentient beings because wars are created first by hate and declaring that someone different or someone independent 
is a reason for war. If someone's different, if you're not like me and you're, you're my enemy, and that is the reason that so many wars are fought. But if you don't think like me or against me, it was what Mr. Bush Sr. was saying. Um, and you know, this is the phrase, you, either you're with me or you're against me. No, I don't have to be with you and I don't have to be against you. There's the middle space I can be. And I think that's what our dialogue today is. Those non-polarized, non-dualistic middle spaces of bridging, of middle spaces of, of making peace. Um, so the, just as a little bit, you know, we had a, uh, in two different meetings, one where we were marking 25 years of organic gain. And this too is related to the other war that's all full in the media. So first it was a polarization between two parts that were part of the same thing a few years ago till the Soviet Union was broken up, but Ukraine was not big in the food system for the world. Big amounts of wheat used to be exported from India. If you look at the maps, you know, till the colonizing destroyed us, but we used to be exporters of wheat. Argentina was one of the biggest growers of wheat and exporters of wheat till the GMO soya destroyed Argentina's economy. And today half of Argentina stands in soup kitchens because wheat was food. GMO soya is market for Monsanto, another war uh, instrument, Roundup, to kill plants. Agent Orange, used today for herbicide, but used in Vietnam War, uh, you know, the, again, to kill the trees and the forest so you could bomb the Viet Cong. GMO soya has devastated Argentina and I've done public, we did a public trial of Monsanto and the Argentinians had come. The cancer rates are going through the ceiling and the spraying round up so that even in a garden, you can't grow your own crops because the spray is destroying your kitchen garden. The United States used to be a big exporter of wheat. And I remember in 1975, when the embargoes took place, American wheat landed in the Soviet Union. And that's where, when the world discovered there were five companies controlling the trade. Brilliant book called Merchants of Grain. I learned a lot from it when I was writing my book on the Green Revolution. Five companies. Now they're four because um, Cargill bought Continental the second. But these five used to trade in wheat, both Argentinian wheat as well as American wheat. And the year there was a, a, a drought in Siberia, they, their satellites could tell them there's a, there's a drought. So they just turned their ships to Soviet Union. And because these companies are registered in Panama and here and there, American wheat treat the Soviet Union in spite of the sanction. Now here are all these places where wheat used to grow that isn't growing wheat anymore. And now everyone is panicking. Oh my God, what's going to, have to wheat, happen to wheat with the Ukraine war? What's going to happen to wheat with Russia and Ukraine fighting? And what I am watching, you know, this is the part that um, for me is troubling. Not only that there is this constant feeding the war with more weaponry, because that's all when, you know, Mr. Biden is traveling, um, that's all he's saying is how many more weapons can I give you? And I, yeah, I will say NATO is not there, but I will have the weapons there and let the weapons do the killing. But there are two other wars that are taking place behind it. And these are the kind of wars that I've been forced to engage in to create a culture of peace. One is the wars around food and the instruments of how you grow food. It was earlier chemicals and chemical fertilizers. And then from the 90s onwards, it became GMOs. And uh, because I've done so much work on GMOs, you know, the way they're made is you have a normal plant, you take a cell of that plant, and then you shoot with a gene gun. That's, that's the technology. You shoot with a gene gun to introduce a, a, a gene that doesn't belong to the plant and add two more instruments, antibiotic promoters, so the, all over you're spreading antibiotics, and viral promoters. But it's not working because plants are tensile 
strength of tuning forks. And when you mess that around, you get collapse of resilience, you get everything else. So uh, there's a huge push for chemicals and GMOs in Europe right now. Europe was supposed to have gone into a brilliant policy for local economies that are not war economies. It's called fork, farm to fork. The same corporations that were war chemical corporations became agribusiness corporations, became chemical corporations, became GMO corporations, are now desperately trying to push that you have to have GMOs in Europe. You have to have more chemical farming, undo everything, all the gains of agroecology, all the gains of organic, all the gains of biodiversity. So that's the war we need to be looking at so that citizens can cultivate their cultures of peace and Jody behind you with the coat pink, you know, that's my world. That's my world of growing diversity, growing flowers. And India used to be, you know, we, we weren't rich, but we were rich in culture. And I remember coming to tribal areas, the women would be dressed in beautiful flowers while they're going to their fields to work. On, on work sites in Chennai, you know, women as construction workers, the poorest of the poor, jasmine in the hair. And I do think one of our gift economy pledges should be we are going to grow flowers for the bees and ourselves and each other. We're going to grow gardens of hope for the bees, for all beings on earth, to feed people who are going hungry. We will not let war unleash another panic to create new food wars and new agricultural wars. The second element of this that I do feel pained by is a culture of peace and an economy of peace is basically one which says, you have been displaced. Here's my home. It's for your, for your refuge. We have a lovely word in India for it, it's called ashram. You know, when all our places of love and care and shelter are called ashram. Ashre is where you get protection. Ashram is the place where you get protection. But the word ashram also applies to every learning place, every place of making peace through the mind. The, the heartbreaking part, Jody mentioned Afghanistan just recently. Here are the refugees standing in lines at the border, applying in the United States. And here are the Ukrainians just walking through. And you know, we had 20,000 students in Ukraine, most of them studying medicine. All of them have talked about how, as they were getting out at the border, they were treated as second-class citizens. They weren't treated as second-class citizens as students, but at the borders, they were treated as second-class citizens. And they're all talking about the rise of white superiority. A new apartheid is growing, now introduced, into the displaced people of war. And I think our culture of the gift has to continue to say, there's going to be more displaced people with climate havoc, also a result of an agriculture of war. 50% of the greenhouse gases come from an industrial war-like agriculture, 50%. The displaced people of climate are indirectly displaced people of war. And we need to start thinking of everyone must have a home but if everyone's displaced, then we do need to start thinking as one earth family, as one caring family, as one giving family, and as Jen's work has shown again and again and again. When you're taking and you're grabbing, there's scarcity, fear, competition, conflict. And when you have the giving, it's abundance. There's always more than enough in the gift. And I think now, particularly now with these multiple layers of wars, now is the time for the gift economy, for gardens of the gift economy to be sown all over. I love to you and Jen, get well. Thank you so much, Vrindana. Wow, that was amazing. Thank you for that teaching of, of how deep this war is, um, both ah, to the, our food yes, sources and to uh, the people. Uh, 
Um, and bringing up the racism of the refugees so important for us to witness. Um, Starhawk, so lovely to have you here. Um, we are all ready to be with you and um, your blessing. So I'm going to turn Judy. it. Um, yes? Just before I know each but uh, Starhawk will do a beautiful meditation. Just want to say, we were together in Cancun where Starhawk was making peace while there was attempts to create disturbance in the WTO protest. So I remember you with love, Starhawk. Aww. I always remember that, Vandana. I've been, um, you know, such an admirer of yours and your work. And I also remember seeing you at the Permaculture Convergence in India and just, uh, I don't know, just so much appreciation for all that you do. It's wonderful to see you here. So yes, I uh, have been doing a regular meditation for protection for Ukraine Friday mornings at 9 a.m. Pacific time on Instagram. And I just want to say like, you know, sometimes I feel very mixed about doing something that's just purely meditation or spiritual. Um, because it can be an excuse for not doing something practical in real life. I think at best what it can do is help strengthen the real world stuff that we do and that the spiritual work works best when we also do something in the real living world. So I encourage you all. Um, we've been raising money for a permaculture group, perma Ukraine Permaculture that has been providing medical and first aid supplies into Ukraine and also helping refugees get resettled in eco villages. Um, I know Vandana was talking about the racism. Uh, our organization, Earth Activist Training, has also been working since August to help a group of permaculturalists from Afghanistan who a friend of mine had been working with and training for 10 years that we're doing incredible human rights and peace work and the difficulty of finding, not finding places for them, but getting them through the government red tape and the borders and the regulations has been immense. But we are finally able to get a couple of families settled in Canada, hopefully in the next couple of months. And we, about nine people have been taken to Portugal uh, for a program that they have there, settling people in villages that have been depopulated. Um, and I think for all of us, working for a world of open borders, uh, where we don't have these restrictions against people, uh, I think is one of the most powerful, important things we can do. Um, so let's do the meditation and just take a breath. Take some deep breaths down into your belly, feel your roots in the earth, as if you were a tree settled on the earth. You can actually put roots down into the soil. And maybe take a moment and acknowledge the indigenous people of the land where you are. Right now, I'm in the land of the Kashaya Pomo um, on the west coast of California people that also knew colonization by the Russians because this was the area that the Russians came to furthest south in the 1800s. Later, colonization by the Spanish, the Californians, the Americans, but the Pomo are still here. Uh, they are growing. They have recently acquired land back on the coast, some of their ancient gathering grounds and they are a huge example of caring for the land and of resilience for all of us. So maybe take a moment and acknowledge uh, the original peoples of the land where you are. And maybe take a breath and acknowledge our ancestors. So many of us have ancestors that have migrated from one place to another. Uh, that have had to flee war, oppression. My own family, my grandparents all came from Ukraine in the early part of the 1900s, fleeing anti-Semitism. 
So maybe just take a moment and let us acknowledge that some of us may be indigenous to the place where we are, but so many of us uh, are here because our ancestors found a welcome somewhere. And then taking a breath, imagine bringing up some of that good energy from the earth into your body, up through the top of your head, out like branches and down to touch the earth again. You feel the sunlight on your leaves and branches. Take a deep breath, draw that in, draw that down. And as you feel that energy move through you, moving up from the earth and down from the sky, like you too. Imagine that map of the Ukraine, that country, those borders, that shape. And imagine the center of it, a sunflower, the national symbol of Ukraine, a sunflower which is such a symbol of life and joy and radiance. And sunflowers also have this amazing capacity to take up toxins, to take up lead and heavy metals and to sequester them in their stems so that they can actually help remediate toxic soil. And taking a breath, imagine the center of that sunflower. And you know, in the center of a sunflower is spirals upon spirals upon spirals. So maybe as you breathe, imagine that energies that come into that center of the sunflower that might come in with malintent uh, get spiraled out into another direction, turned around, calling in unexpected consequences of actions. And the spiral itself is a symbol of regeneration and renewal. So taking a breath, calling in those forces of healing, of renewal, of regeneration. And then imagine the circle around that center. The circle of life. And now see the rays of that sunflower, the petals extend out, covering Ukraine. See the beautiful golden color? You know how the petals of a flower will glow with sunlight? Taking a breath, feeling that glow, feeling the inspiration that Ukraine and its resistance, its commitment are giving to the whole world. Inspiration of courage, of people coming together, united. And imagine those petals covering all of that map of Ukraine with protection, extending out and sending protection, courage, healing to all the refugees who fled to other countries, touching the hearts of people to open their hearts and welcome for refugees. And take a breath and let's extend some of that protection out to the people of Russia, to the incredibly courageous protesters who stood up and said no to this war, to the people who maybe have been confused by propaganda, but who in their hearts do not want war. And taking a deep breath, Let's know that we have extended this protection to Ukraine. There are many, many wars and many, many people around the world. 
we can only work on one thing at a time. But just take a breath and imagine the rays of the sunflower cradling the whole globe with that energy of peace, of regeneration, of welcome, of compassion. Take a breath, say thank you. Thank you to the ancestors. Thank you to the indigenous folks. And as you breathe, let yourself come back. Open your eyes again and say thank you uh, to all those who've put together this beautiful gathering. I, uh, I won't be able to stay on very long because I have another commitment here in my community, but I will put into the chat the link if people want to donate to the project in Ukraine. And again, thank you all for inviting me on. Thanks, Starhop. Uh, before you leave, could you also put in uh, the link to your Friday meditation at Instagram? Uh, is that happening every Friday? That is happening every Friday, and I don't know exactly how to link to it. <laughs> okay, no worries. I'll Where find it and make sure we send it out so people can yeah. find I'll, you. I'll, I'll help. I can I can get it up there, Starhawk. Don't worry. Yeah. Great. And thank thanks, you, Starhawk. For, yeah, thank you for um, this offering to this community and, and all you do for peace. I love that Bandana related to how you model peace and can bring people to peace. So We've just been talking about, you know, how do we, in a time where uh, we're driven by the media to reaction, to um, reaction, how do we respond? And I, I, I raised up that your response was to offer this beautiful moment of grounding and prayer and connection. Um, are there other um, things from, the permaculture, your permaculture um, tool chest um, that you would offer in this moment um, as we as we move, as you said, from being together into engagement, um, you know, like what are some of the things of bringing ourselves present to life instead of death, which um, is where the media wants to drive our brains. Um. You know, in permaculture, there are three core ethics, um, care for the earth, care for the people, care for the future. And I think those are good ones to apply to whatever we do. Um, you know, permaculture is a lot about systems thinking. Um, how do we, you know, what's the practical end? I mean, I've been doing earth-based spirituality work for decades, long before I got into doing permaculture, but permaculture seemed like the practical end of it all. Um, so I encourage people, you know, just to think about that. What are the ways we can care for the earth, including our own communities? Um, what are the ways we can care for other people? How do we acknowledge that we can't care for the earth unless we care for other people? And we can't truly really care for people if we don't take care of the systems that sustain us and support us. Um, if we do that, then we can create a future that's in balance where generations that come after us will be able to live in peace. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Big hug, miss you. Yeah, I'll also put in the chat, um, our permaculture teaching organization, Earth Activist Training. We have a lot of different courses coming up. Uh, we just finished a course on permaculture for climate activists, and we're probably going to run it again in the fall. So you could go there or to my website, starhawk.org, and get on the mailing list and get all the information about what we're going to be doing. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Um, so uh, next, I want to bring up uh, Kelly Curry, who um, is a 
gift peace economy um, activist in Oakland, California. And, you know, Kelly, like we said in the beginning, it's like, how do we take our practices of the gifting peace economy and bring them to this moment in history? And um, so I want to just ask Kelly, how is she doing that in Oakland? And how, um, how has the war economy affected the, the culture she lives in? Kelly, welcome. Hey, good morning. What a beautiful honor to be here with all of you this morning. What a gorgeous way to start this oh, just beautiful spring weekend. Um, you know, as a kid, I'm, I'm 52, and I didn't realize as a child that I was growing up in a war. You know, American kids who were under the Reagan era, when Reagan said, we're going to take things back to the good old days, um, I believe he was talking about <sighs> taking people back to slavery, um, removing the sovereignty that people were feeling, a lot of the joyous, you know, sense of communities coming together, Native Americans, Black Americans, the music that was happening in those days. And I kind of think that they came in and like, we're going to shut it down. And that was what happened with the food systems. That was what happened with, you know, um, green spaces. And so for the last 40 years, we've been coming through that. Hip hop was used as a tool, you know, to destroy sovereignty and, and, and collectivism and pride and beauty in the community. So at every end we're hit and the food system being, you know, like that space, food and housing, growing your own food, being able to share your own food, um, being able to adorn yourself on Sunday and go to church and just have a beautiful time and not worry about it just one day. All of that was very much removed. So coming here to Oakland and becoming a part of an amazing food justice um, network, planning justice, acting on Verba, people's grocery, where people are growing food, sharing the food um, very, 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 very athletically. Um, 10 years into that for us, what it looks like is we do smoothies on street corners. We give the smoothies out. We, we teach young people to actually go out and um, blend and share that. And we're at a very different point right now because we're at the, a space where the youth are ready, not ready, the youth are actually taking charge with a lot of the programs and projects. Um, we've really linked in the, the economics of it, like making sure that young people have jobs and people who have been incarcerated have jobs in the food system, uh, bringing home uh, food to their communities. And it's made all the difference, it makes all the difference. Creating that really firm network, local peace economy, Jody, that you're always talking about, because it's obliterated, the separation creates this thing where there's no trust, there's no love, we're not looking. But we go back to the garden and you go back to the space of creation and you're just in that and people have that um, as an example. It's uh, restorative, it's, um, re I, I won't say rehumanizing, it's just create, it, it brings you back into the systems of what it feels like to be grounded. And right now, as I speak, um, we're signing on a deal to um, purchase a t-shirt shop so that the young people can be making t-shirts, selling them. We'll be blending smoothies as well. And we're also getting you know, that food system work together. So very aggressive, very athletic, a lot of fun and very hopeful right now. Very, very, very hopeful, very hopeful time uh, for the work here in Oakland, California. For the first time in a long time, it's like the sun's kind of coming out. Check. <laughs> <laughs> Check. Thank you, Kelly. Thank <laughs> Thanks you. for being thank with you. us um, in your garden. Uh, thank you for taking us into the soil um, and um, talking about, you know, the other wars that uh, we're, we're kind of in constantly. I appreciate both you and Vananda for reminding us of the, the, the wars that we are uh, inside of daily. Um, I definitely so want to also, I want to definitely also lift up the radical, radical, radical nature of what you all are doing at Code Pink. What all, everyone in this dais right now is doing to, to point people's attention to the impact of separation in our communities. The only way that we're able to buy this t-shirt shop, Electric Smoothie Lab, is because somebody from uh, the board who has, you know, has capacity and is able to help move us through. If that person weren't there to do it, it wouldn't happen. They're afraid to walk through the neighborhoods. They're afraid of the kids that we work with. So what you all are doing to point people's attention to war economy here at home is really important and it helps my work. And I appreciate you so much on um, the power of all of you. Thank you so much. God bless you for making my work easier. <laughs> 
Well, thank you. And you just expressed the, the gifting economy um, that we're here celebrating. It's the gifting that allows the next level of abundance uh, to be birthed. So um, we've we've gone around and um, I, I know Vandana has to um, leave. It's very late where she is and she has an early get up. So any final words before you leave us, Vandana? Yeah, maybe I will, you know, just because Kelly's given us this beautiful walk through her garden. Um, I briefly mentioned in the beginning about where I am. And I want to just take you back to the communities and the women I've spent the whole day with. Uh, I, like I said, I started to save seeds. And in a gift, you don't calculate, is this useful? Is it profitable? You just give care. And we just saved every seed we could. And among these seeds were seeds that were salt tolerant and flood tolerant. And then the 1999 super cyclone came, 30,000 people were washed away. Um, and since that time, every year, two, three, four cyclones have started to come in the Bay of Bengal. India is the worst impacted with climate change, something that does not come into the news. Whether it's sea level rise, we've got one of the longest coastlines, one of the highest density of coastline, the third pole in the Himalaya where I come from, melting, the glaciers are going. And then all these cyclones and storms that are increasing their frequency and intensity. So here we're in these little seats that the women shared with each other as gifts and continue to do it, that we can face this new war climate war that as I said, is linked to the food system. And the second, which is another very important point that again was, came from the ground today. See, I started to work on organic farming and the gift economy of, you know, the gift of growing food. For me, the gift of growing food was giving to the earth. So she will give us food, not in exchange as Jen reminds us, but in abundance, in unconditional love. And all our work has been showing that we produce more food when we care for the earth. We produce more food when we grow biodiversity. And today the women after women would get up, oh, by shifting from chemicals, my economy has improved. I am earning twice as much by just giving up war chemicals. So whether it is the gift economy in the seed and sharing and community seed banks and reclaiming the commons, which is where gift take place, because the enclosure of the commons is where wars take place. And the fact that in the gift economy, there's more of everything for everyone. That has been my beautiful day. And my beautiful day has ended in an even more beautiful way with all of you. I will now say good night to you all. And let's keep growing the culture of peace and the, group, the culture of the gift. Thank you again for all you all do. Thank you so much, Vandana. Sweetest dreams and sleep well. <laughs> All right, so um, we've gone around and shared, um, you know, our response. Um, Kelly, I just want to ask you, um, you know, when you witness what's happening um, in Ukraine, um, we're talking about how we move from reactivity to response. Um, your response always is to feed uh, those in need uh, a smoothie. Were there other responses that you witnessed in your community, um, either reactions or responses that you wanna share with us? One thing, you know, I've been working, like I said, with the youth. And one thing that um, I realized is that once we, they're trained up and they're doing what they're doing, um, they're able to give back in ways through their prayers. I, it's just amazing. Um, watching them respond to what we feel is like the end of the world or it's we, we, we in this kind of reactivity zone. The understanding that the youth who are moving forward really know that psychically they have this power and they can connect through prayer and through good vibes, metaphysically through to the, what's happening, you know, around, around the world in a positive way through holding their silence. I, I've been completely blown away and awe-inspired and I think that for me, because um, I'm going through an illness right now, it's, just, it's very humbling. So it, put, it puts me in a space of silence quite a lot. So I've got to watch and listen and feel what is uh, possible 
and I know it's not possible to walk to Ukraine and pass out smoothies and this and that, but I am training um, gardens and gardens and gardens, gardens of children who will be making smoothies for those kids when they come over, writing to them, sending them text messages, TikTok, it's whatever, and connecting in that way. And that connection is what's gonna bring us over this to the other side of this rainbow that we're on. That's the connection. Wow, so I'm very inspired. Beautiful and hopeful. Thank you so much. <laughs> So now, um, I, you know, now that we've planted these seeds and we've talked about um, reaction response and regenerativity and love and, um, you know, in the face of uh, hate and fear and destruction, I'd, I'm curious about um, how uh, folks here have felt the reactivity that, you know, is the first response and how you've been able to transition that into a response. Um, so I guess we can't bring folks up to talk. Um, so I'm wondering the best way to do this is, um, I, I think love the voice. best way is to actually have them type their response to your prompting into the chat and then we can read them out loud and, and dialogue around those. Okay. So while folks are typing, I'm going to talk about a couple of other ways. And, and um, I love that everyone that has spoken has said that, you know, we, you know, we need to engage. And yes, for the future, it is engagement. It's care for the people, care for the planet, um, uh, care for uh, the future. And I, you know, I think about like the distraction that this moment could be for everyone because it becomes the, uh, the what I call the folly of fretting, in the sense that there's nothing we can do except those three people that should be at the table negotiating negotiating peace. But what we can do is care for the planet, care for the people, and care for the future, which is the gifting peace economy. Those that's it's the same. So in what way um, it, it also, you know, it, it also strengthens your own tensile strength of the tuning fork for peace that each of everyone that's spoken today has uh, talked about. And, you know, we talked about moving from us versus them to all of us and um, and limitation to imagination. Um, you know, one of the things that's come up, and, and I think it's the core of Jen's work, is this scarcity um, that that it, it makes us think inside of to abundance. And um, I'm just curious, you know, also, if you want to type in, what would um, scarcity to abundance look like for you right now? What would being the gifting peace economy look like for you as we, you know, leave each other today, what, what would it be that um, you, your mood, your move to respond with? Um, also, um, we heard from Kelly that, um, you know, one of the other tenets of the peace economy is urgency to wisdom. And we are driven in, in this moment, you know, to that sense of urgency, like make it be over. And as Kelly reflected um, that, you know, in her space of, of healing, that she's uh, gone from urgency to witness and listening. Um, Kelly, is there anything else you wanna share about that? Because um, you, you definitely know the world of urgency and your healing crisis is taking you into, into wisdom and, and anything okay. you can teach us about that transition. I can share that um, it's almost like a law of attraction. Like I've been desperately working on myself to move outside of the ways that I contribute to a diseaseful world. And, um, you know, that goes along with our thoughts and how, what we eat and to a large extent, but just also our, our vibration. And because I spend time in nature and I spend time with people and I spend time doing programs and projects. And I'm also part of the war economy that's spinning capitalistic, go, 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 ag ag you know, aggressive. <laughs> the illness has like knocked me down like on my ass so much that I get a chance to just kind of survey the world from this place of being in it, but not really being in it, in it. 
And um, in that silence, I realized, as I've been saying, the earth is the only one telling the truth. And so what's, that's taken on a different tonality. So what it means is the herbs that I put in my body, the food I put in my body, really needing to go and ground on the earth to reduce inflammation in my body. Like every, everything I need, I've moved, it's almost like I've moved from the land of an questions to the land of answers through this situation. And when I say the earth is the only one telling the truth, like if we look at the mycelium network under our feet, under the ground, the trees taking care of one another, the grass taking care of one another. If you look at the spine of a tree and see that it's our nervous system, it's who we are. Um, if, if, if we were able to point our attention to the earth and like folks were saying, like, like Starhawk, the systems, they'll hold us. They will hold us through this time of unfortunate dis disease and disaster with this megalomaniacal crazy you know, unloved men are fighting it out and controlling other people's destinies. But the earth will hold us to these times that are very uncertain and give us what we need to be able, someone said to me, how do you wake up in the morning from so much pain? And I said, the earth, she's guiding me. Like she's beckoning me, the smell of the jasmine, the life, the life, the life is pulling me. And, and that is the only truth. That's what keeps us here and pulls us here is life. The, the, the laughter of the children. The, so when we're looking at what's going on in Ukraine, we can also come here and say, wow, I wanna do something kind for a child in my community or someone in my community who, who needs something or just engage in life in a way that I haven't. And so I think um, the earth is there every day for that conversation with us. I just hope more people really delve in, really, really delve in in a way that is meaningful this spring to that conversation and that reality. Thank you, Jody, for that. Thanks, Kelly. I have, I have one more question because um, someone has a question about the short-term deference of people being killed in Ukraine, um, and um, and I, I don't. It's a it's a question that could go a lot of directions, but it um, raised up for me, you know, this our our short-term attention to the victims of war that um, also Vandana brought up, the victims of our food system, the victims of the weapons, the victims of the militarism in our street, the victims of racism. Um, and um, Kelly, you and I were at the border, um, what, three years ago, and um, we, wow. witnessed, we witnessed a different border experience as, as we're, we're witnessing a gifting border experience at uh, the border of Poland and, and uh, Ukraine, where people are taken into homes and where millions are fed a day. Well, maybe you could wow. reflect on how, how you reflect on that difference um, for yourself. You mean what, what, what we experienced at the border? Yeah, and what's happening at the border of Ukraine? I mean, I think the thing that, I, from what I've, the things that have interested me about Ukraine is the immediacy with which, because of, especially the younger generations, how fluid they are with communication, the immediacy with which we get information and news, like the African babies and, and moms and students not being able to go to Poland and all these things that's laying bare. And in my situation now, with the way I'm looking at the world now, the very unique way I'm looking at it, even looking back at that situation in because we're in such a state of flummox. It's kind of like things are going to be what they are. And each, our each individual response is going to, because of, because of technology and because of communication, and really God, I think it's God at this point, laying everything bare. Whatever we do is going, how we respond, like the little petty um, officers not letting the, the, the people get on the bus to go to Poland and lying to them. The whole world knows about that now. The entire world knows that that happened. Now those people who did it get a chance to reflect. Um, the thing is about Mexico that was interesting because things have changed astrologically where we are, what's going on in the world. The thing that happened what, what, that really impacted me in Mexico was that so much of it was happening behind God's back. There were so many things that were happening that people will never know about. And I feel now that with the Ukraine situation, like I said, things have changed and it's also a different world, you know, spotlight. It's Europe and that kind of thing. But it's a real opportunity for transition. It's a real opportunity for us to look at our little petty ways and the way we relate to one another. This is a, a fractal. What's going on in the Ukraine is a fractal. You, you're either making love or you're making war. And that happens in the heart. Um, and I think at first with all of us, 
and Jody, that's something you and I've talked about a lot. It's like this happens, it's happening on TV, but it's also happening in our household. It's happening in our basement, it's happening in our schools. And that's the opportunity for us to say, how am I participating in this fuckery and how can I stop? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so that gives us the other, you know, how are we participating in this fuckery uh, project of, um, again, you know, what drives us to war, what creates disharmony, where is hate in our heart, and how do we transmute that into gifting and love, and that, like right. you said, and just being aligned with life, um, because what we're watching is is the taking of life so um i'm i'm looking for some questions of, of like how others would respond um i'll i'll uh i can um maybe you know feed the imagination a little more but imagination is something we want to be uh cultivating um so encouraging your imagination your dreaming uh, into your um, response, out of reaction into response. But, you know, another thing uh, the war economy uh, thrives on is consumption and um, instead of creation. And so um, I wish I could show you, but there was um, just in the streets of London, there was the most beautiful knitted uh, sunflower that said peace on it. And you know the the space where we create and delight is so important. And we we do live in a world of consumption. And and in that moment where we want to consume, I call us to what can we create? Um, we we you know we are in the war economy, taken away from that space of creation. And that doesn't mean, you know, with the with needles or with paints or with a nail, but even uh, with our community, what can you create together? What, you know, can you go out and, you know, paint a mural with some kids on a, on a signpost that speaks to, you know, that what people are longing for, kind of like Yoko Ono did, Imagine Peace, what, what would brighten a heart in your neighborhood if you painted it on a stop shine pole? Um, so, you know, think of these moments too of, of grief and heaviness that creation can be a, a response that um, nourishes others and nourishes your own heart. And then of course, you know, from accumulation to sharing resources, we we're seeing that, but um, what what in your neighborhood can that be? Um, Vendana talked about you know that this is an interesting war um, because it and we're we're really watching in this moment uh, a, a realignment of a non-aligned movement um, where you see if you really looked at the earth and it's in the way it truly is, instead of the way map makers um, from the north uh, draw it, that there is a new non-aligned movement that is saying no, because you know when uh, NATO and uh, um, the U.S. is pushing Putin into bombing, they're you know realigning uh, oil, where uh, the the oil companies are just again raping the consumer. Um, that has nothing to do with the war, but what does have an enormous amount to do with this war is the food system, is that Africa um, gets 40% of its wheat from Ukraine and Russia, and they are looking at it and saying, really, you are going to sanction and you're going to not sit at the, the table and, and, and come to an agreement and we're going to starve? And so you're watching all the leaders of Africa not align with the US and NATO. You're watching all the leaders of Latin America. You're watching, you know, Modi from India, that, you know, black and brown people of the world have said enough. Um, and they are seeing the white supremacy and they are responding to it and that it will have an effect 
um, on our world. Um, that's six billion people compared to a, a billion people that are, you know, it's like sanctions like this. They don't, it doesn't just affect Russia. Um, also, storytelling. Um, you know, storytelling that helps us understand. And, you know, one of the things we, we do or we're forced to do in the war economy and in times of war is we're forced to um, be in black and white stories. But we know that's not how the world is. And when we're forced into black and white stories, it narrows our imagination and it narrows our hearts and it constrains us because life isn't that simple. Life is vibrant and there's so much happening in those vibrations. And so, you know, one of the things is curiosity about the other. And so I want to tell a story that Putin tells office. And by the way, Putin is a war criminal. I don't like the man. I um, don't approve of what he's done for a very long time. And I'm actively, and we at Could Pink are actively supporting the peacemakers in Russia who are out there, you know, calling for peace and being put in jail. That said, we also have to be in relationship with who this person is. If we wanna not demonize, if we wanna not, at Code Pink we say we don't, this, this doesn't get us anywhere, but stuck. So how do we unstick ourselves? So let me just uh, tell you a little Putin story that he tells a lot. Um, so it's how I've, I've heard it over the years. But he said that when he was a little boy, he, he couldn't sleep and he was going to the kitchen to get some food. And he went out in the hallway of the house and a giant rat was in the hallway. And he chased it and he ran after it and he chased it into a corner. And as soon as he got it in the corner, this rat jumped right back at him and he ran to his room and locked the door. And he said it was a very pivotal moment in his life that you know when he's stuck in a corner, he's gonna pounce. So uh, what happens is the US and the Ukraine and NATO pushes him into a corner and he pounces. So what do we learn about that? You know, like he told you what he was gonna do. Um, so it allows us to be in a story and it reminds us that we can call on our leadership. Many of us are in NATO countries to say, get at that table and start negotiating. That the only way a war ends is in conversation, is in um, humanizing the other, no matter how horrible the other is. I mean, I come from the United States of America with George Bush and a Congress that allowed the invasion of an innocent country that we weren't even relational to, that had absolutely nothing to do with us. So um, we, you know, we keep living and breathing. So how do we be relational with everyone, with those in Ukraine, with those in Russia? And you know, it's still three people at the top. It's not the people of the United States. It's not the people of the NATO countries. It's not the people of the Ukraine. It's not the people of Russia. Again, it is, you know, white men at the table uh, leading uh, young people to give their lives and women and children to be uh, violently uh, killed by weapons that um, unfortunately should not exist. And we need to stop the selling of the investing in because Weapon companies make a killing on killing. Our tax dollars go to weapons companies. And if war is for profit, war will not end. So Lillian, I see your hand raised. Sorry, I wanted to read a comment since you were asking uh, the participants. Uh, there's a, a comment by Peggy Antrobos that I find very interesting. She says, all the speakers have reflected on the connections between all the crises and wars, the climate crisis, the public health crisis, the food and refugee crisis. Stark Hawk recognized that we can only work on one thing, but we can recognize that that one thing contributes to changing things. We need a campaign of autonomous organizations, networks, movements, 
all recognize the need for another world. The technology allows us to do this now in a way we haven't had before. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And yes, um, that's a great reminder of us to be engaged because it is those of us engaged um, in a different way that is creating that healthy as um, a, you know, both Vandana and Zora had that healthy, life-giving, vibrant, peaceful future. And um, if anyone wants to be engaged um, in the streets together, uh, Code Pink has created an international call and we've been in the streets uh, in cities across the world. It's um, peaceinukraine.org. I'll type it in when I'm done talking. Um, but peaceinukraine.org, we've had hundreds of events in cities. We will soon be calling for more. Um, and uh, you can do one locally. Three people can show up. Um, you send in your photos or you can look back and see what we did on the, I think it was the sixth of this month um, across the world. Um, and uh, yes, being together, standing for peace is always important, but knowing that everything that you do in a way different than the war economy, that as was just pointed out, at the roots of all of these disasters is war, is that othering, is this cultural practice of violence. And I just wanna remind everyone that war will not end until we end the war economy that war serves the war economy, war serves the elite, war serves the empire. Um, it is there in service of, so that um, a more reason to be developing, cult cultivating and living a gifting economy because that itself is um, a, a peace move, is an anti-war action because we can't end something if something else doesn't exist to replace it. And we're all, uh, cultivating the future together um, by cultivating the gifting economy and all the practices of the gifting peace economy. Um, do we have um, another one, um, Liliana, that you want to read? Yeah, there is um, there's a question by Cecilia Gressing. How do you create a dialogue with a white supremacist who has no empathy for others? How do you stop someone who does not want a dialogue? I believe a nonviolent putting imprisonment coup is necessary. Believe nonviolent imprisonment of coup is necessary. I guess she's wanting to get put in, in prison. But I guess he's, a, he's a criminal. He's a criminal. <laughs> he, he first <laughs> He first needs to sit at the table so we can stop the violence, you know, and guess what? Um, it has happened before. Uh, so the only other answer is the nonstop bombing. Um, and so, you know, just he he's said he wants to he wanted to negotiate in the beginning. Um, so he, you know, it's like. Yes, he's a horrible, horrible person, but if you put yourself in a corner and you're imagining only, only allow, how do you put someone in prison who's killing innocent people in Ukraine? He wants, he wants to go to the table. Zelensky wants to go to the table. NATO and the U.S. have to be at that table because they're the ones with the, with the strings. Um, so, you know, we can't, we must call for that. And then we must take Putin to the ICC and find him guilty for war crimes. And at the same time, we will have to find Bush guilty for war crimes, his or worse. So, um, you know, uh, yes, when people violate um, and, and are brutal in that way, they must be held accountable. When they're not held accountable, guess what? Somebody else will do it. Um, without accountability. And we live in a, a world of wars without accountability. Um, and that creates, begets more wars. So yes, accountability for sure. There's another question from Mary B. And she's asking Kelly how she started her program and how someone can start a similar program. Thank you. 
Awesome question for Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that, for that question. Um, I started the program in, um, by just starting it. I met a little boy who was um, diabetic and I was making smoothies at an event and he was really afraid to try it. The smoothie, which could really have really helped him. And um, I was so impassioned. He lived in a food desert and it was just a mess, a school to prison pipeline. And I just started going out on weekends with people who would go with me doing smoothies on street corners, like basketball tournaments, like wherever I could. And, people, and, the, and the word traveled, people got to, to know. But what, what you can do is um, get, first of all, we're, if you want to stay in touch, we're Electric Smoothies, electric, www.electricsmoothies with an S dot O-R-G. Um, and I'm happy to talk you, walk you through. I have a book that explains, and you can find that on the website that explains the journey, um, but very grassroots, very community. I'm a doer, so it's like I, I was able to go out and do this. It's something I could do and talk about it and get people involved. It took eight years. Now we're, like I said, buying a t-shirt shop. We're going to be making smoothies. We have, you know, um, really great affiliations. And that's the most important thing is the relationship building and connecting with people who, who believe in what you want to see. Um, don't fuck with anybody who doesn't believe in what you're doing. Keep, keep wish them well. Keep keep it going, because there's enough work to do. Uh, find people who believe that ch children and people need to eat and be nourished from the earth. And you keep pushing with that. And please call me if you ha have any questions or connect with me. Happy to help. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you bring us back to um, that. This is always done. Whatever we do in community and in relationship. And it's how we are creating that tensile strength and how we're creating the future is in relationship together, in love, in care. You know, this, uh, and even in our, um, the wounds that we hold, the trauma that we hold inside, in the process, those healing journeys happen. Um, even, we don't know what we've created, but we have created the soil and the possibility for the healing <laughs> journey that we need that Kelly can attest to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Love, love, absolutely. love of others and care of others brings healing. So, yes. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I just want to say that when we do that, like I thought I was building, doing this thing for this little boy and, you know, and, 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 and his peers, but what it turned out was that I was actually building a world that I could rely on and count on the people who I agree with that we need a better world. And we've created this wet, this network, and it's just beautiful. And now that I'm, I'm, I'm going through this situation, those are the people who know about herbs and know about, you know, um, just combinations and know, because Western medicine is pretty much over in many ways. We have to know how to take care of ourselves. So it's been kind of an, as Jody says, an arc. I've been, I was building an arc the whole time. Didn't even know it. <laughs> arc of uh, healing. Yeah. <laughs> um, Kelly's referring to my, that we're inside a flood and that when you're in a flood, you build an arc and that arc is your local peace economy and cultivating it and brings so many gifts uh, back to you. So I want to answer um, uh, Jen's question here. Can you suggest a face saving way out for Putin, even if later he is tried and condemned? And so, yeah, there's a total face saving way out. He already offered it. He, he just wants the Donbass region to be neutral. Um, and he doesn't want NATO any closer than the US promised it to be. Um, and uh, Zelensky's already agreed to that point. And what's keeping us from, you know, stopping this war is that the US and NATO keep sending weapons instead of sitting at the table and saying they'll release the sanctions. Um, so yeah, it's like the only thing we can be doing right now is calling for uh, negotiations and diplomacy. Diplomacy is the only way wars end. Y'all, I don't know how old you are, I can't see your faces, but just a reminder, um, the United States and China, uh, Russia and China lost 20 million people each fighting the war in Russia. Um, you know, the rest of the world lost a lot of people. When you think of how long that went on and how much life was lost, that's, you know, you need to come to a table. And it happens that there was already a Minsk agreement that um, need, just needed to be agreed to and, or by, you know, and Putin wasn't gonna bomb. And um, the US wouldn't agree to no NATO um, near uh, in, uh, 
in Ukraine, which was breaking an agreement it had uh, from many years ago by, you know, conservative Republicans. So, it, you know, it's, we're actually at a place where diplomacy can work. Um, the United States uh, bombed Korea um, with 80% casualties of the country. And a general went to Congress and said, no, I don't need any more money because there is nothing left to bomb. So we, we flattened a country and didn't win. It was a, a peace a negotiation that is in place today that is one of the most violent things that has ever happened on the planet, which was a separation of families, of mothers, of fathers, of children, of brothers, of sisters for 72 years and now they're dead. So United States violence on steroids. Um, Vietnam was an invasion of an innocent country for no reason except that they believed in equality and the United States lost that war. Um, Iraq, the, the, the bombing of an innocent country, a, a devastation of a country with millions dead, millions of refugees internally and externally in Iraq and a country destroyed and sent back to the dark ages, including women who had freedom. U.S. lost that war. Afghanistan, a country that was used by the United States um, to deplete Russia, so it, to deplete the USSR so that the USSR would co collapse. In the meantime, millions of innocent Afghans have died. It was not their war. It was the United States using them in a proxy war against Russia. Now we are in another proxy war of the United States and Russia, and it is using the lives of the people in Ukraine. It must end. And we need to call on our leaders to tell them they must be at the table. They, they, if the United States has all the power it says it does and wields in the world, it has the power to bring this to the end. And just a reminder that um, John F. Kennedy was able to do this in the, in the Cuba Missile Crisis. He had to give a little, he saved face for the um, leadership in the USSR. We moved our missiles away. They moved their missiles away. Everyone gave something, safe face was saved. So, um, you know, just a reminder, this model has happened before and has worked um, uh, with another crazy person. So, um, Judith, I see your hand is raised. Uh, there's a question or a comment by um, uh, Mary Condren uh, from Ireland and um, in response to your earlier question about how are you responding? And says, um, there's a beautiful little film, a short film that the Irish government made for Patrick's Day, where all the buildings were lit up in blue and yellow to honor Ukraine at the same time as an Irish singer sang a beautiful song on the tragedy of what happened in Ireland um, for over 35 years. And um, so she put the link to that film in the chat um, if anyone is interested in uh, having a look at it. What's her name? Mary Condren. Mary, thank you so much. Because you know, one of the things when we're saying what could happen in this diplomacy, one of the things is relating it to the agreement after Bloody Sunday. So um, we, you know, that, that what would happen in the Donbass regions would be um, you know, modeled after what happened in Northern Ireland. So again, we have to point to where you know, perfection is not going to happen. Um, I know many people on here would love to see Putin wiped off the planet. Um, you know, perfection, our, what we want is not gonna happen. We all need to give a little. So let's just start by giving a little into you know, kind of probably what we would, would love to have happen and realize that we all have to give a little and the, to get to peace and it's not perfect and nobody gets their way. But what does happen is the killing stops. And so um, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you for being here from Ireland because we have been using Ireland as a possibility of like how this um, relationship in the Donbass region can work because uh, since the US did the 2014 coup in Ukraine and um, 
funded the um, neo-Nazi groups, they've been, the neo-Nazi groups have been in the Donbass region murdering Russians. So it's super complex and it excites and reacts hearts across the world in different ways is, is really what we're seeing in this moment also. And as peace, as gifting peace, uh, you know, world cultivators, part of that is holding our hearts open for God is all things are possible. You know, the goddess is all things are possible. And um, being able to be witness to, you know, may what serves the world, what serves the people and what serves the future um, be blessed. And it won't be probably what any of us all want. It won't be what they want, but we have to be able to hold the space for the peace that is necessary for the people of Ukraine. We do not wanna see an ongoing war of 20 years. I mean, for Afghanistan, it was 40 years of weapons and war in their cities that still exists today. You know, when we talk about Ukrainian refugees, there are millions of Afghan refugees. We have not opened our doors to 100,000 Afghans being able to come in um, after we destroyed their country. Um, and the, the um, middle schools for girls have been closed down this week. So another place to really witness if one of the things you want to offer in response is education. If you're a teacher, there are so many ways you can be in education. If you have a skill that you want to share, set up a, an opportunity for people to come to your home and make together. Another way of healing, creating a future and gifting making to, to others. Um, Judith, you have another question. Um, this one is from Paula, um, and uh, she says a, a, a voice or a non-voice from Italy, and she makes three points. One of them is that she read Virginia Woolf in 1940, um, and who, about her thoughts of peace during an air raid, um, and uh, being under the, the air raid and using the power of the mind to uh, see the roots of it and, and how to answer it. Her second point is that the core is to be able to stay tuned with what is happening in reality among the powers of the earth and among the victims, and at the same time to put in the public space a radical, visible, positive operational cut, um, and to be able to uh, call uh, the minds somewhere else other than just respond to the, to the fight with a fight. And the third is, in uh, this spirit, we keep Ukrainian and Russian women to talk to each other. And um, we need to open refugee ashrams to keep the capacity of dialogue going ahead in difficult spaces and languages, and to fight polarization. As for example, now the population, uh, the, the positions to support or less support of, of Ukraine are very, very, uh, dangerously polarized. Um, and we have to keep, um, as feminists, we have to keep um, outside alignment to, to continue to see and show that the economic and the patriarchal roots together of, um, together and insist on diplomacy um, where everyone is uh, accepted. So, uh, those are, th are uh, three comments from um, Paola in India, in, uh, sorry, in Italy. In Italy. <laughs> Paola, thank you so much. Yes, wise words. And thank you for bringing in Virginia Woolf. Uh, you bring in um, that call to imagination, um, which is so potent and vital. And I'm so, yes, thank you that they, they come from Virginia Woolf. And then the, the, pivoting, you know, from, from violence and to disaster and heartbreak to what can we nourish? You know, we're, we're, we're here together, um, um, being nourished by being together. I, I wish I could see more faces, um, but um, it is now our call um, to leave this gift that Jen and Letitia and Diana and Liana and Judith are, are holding for us um, and create the same thing. 
um, because it's that resonance. It's that, you know, what, what so many hearts and souls need right now is to be heard um, and is to be redirected from what they can't affect to being engaged in what they can create. Um, so important. Um, so thanks. Um, I'm wondering, there's a question that's asking Kelly, if you could tell us on that note that Jody leaves us with um, a little bit more about your book before we close today. So Kelly, are you there? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, the book came like many things came when I couldn't blend any more smoothies. I had no clear pathway for how I was going to make sure that every kid in Oakland got a smoothie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they shut into a food desert. So I just, start, I, I sat down. Um, I was in that point of being so engaged and so just thunder moving through me with this project and, and trying to s support that child um, that I just laid down and I'm completely out of energy and, and wrote the story. It's called the story of the electric smoothie lab apothecary um, until the streets of the hood flood was green. And it essentially tells the story of um, how we got to a place in America where people are shut into food deserts, what a food desert is, and how this little boy's story, um, this little boy who was being raised in a building where Marcus Garvey organized, um, his organization had an office in that building, the Black Panthers literally organized in the building where this little boy lived, so much empowerment, so much liberation, and yet at the end of the story, um, this little child is shut into a food desert in a, in a school to prison pipeline and a beautiful, smart, smart little boy too. And juxtaposed um, my father who had been a sharecropper and was born in 1946, born to a very poor family and ended up, you know, making his way to America, graduating from Ivy League, Ivy League, you know, universities and having a successful career as an executive. He made it out. And does that opportunity exist for this little boy who um, uh, is, it has a disease has a, has a morbid disease already at the age of seven or eight, is brilliant like my dad, but you know, lock, locked in. And so I think um, a lot of the questions that we deal with as, 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 as Westerners is dealt with in this story of how do you impact change? That's such a big deal and um, keep your head screwed on straight. And I think the one thing that I've been hearing through all these conversations that I really want to note and really want to, as we're watching what's going on in Ukraine, it's something that Thich Nhat Han reminded me of and, and laid my heart to rest, to, to ease, is that um, there's a lot of heartbreak going on. There's a lot of heartbreak going around and it's okay to be heartbroken. It's something that I didn't anticipate like doing the work that I was doing, but how can I live in a wealthy country? How can I be highly melanated, active? And on this side of town, these children are starving. And that's the reality of war economy in America it's the reality of what's going on in Flint, Michigan, where children are opening up the tap and mud is pouring out. How do we, how do we live in this? And that's a real question. Like, how do we live in this? How, what, what do we set up for ourselves so we can be separate? What has been set up with us that we can be separate? And then also sometimes justify. Um, and that's what I've, I ran into a lot of, and I think I talk about it a little bit in the book, but um, how people justify that people are starving. Um, and how does that become a part of how we relate to our environment, to our society, to our opportunities, to the opportunities of our children? How complicit does it make us? And I think um, when we're watching what's going on in Ukraine, all of these questions, how complicit, like this is our government, all of these things. But going back to what Thich Nhat Hanh reminded me of is that we're suffering, we're suffering, we're suffering. Right now, we're having these conversations and Jody's doing these things and Code Pink and all of the activists out of love, radical love, and we're still suffering. And that's the dimension that we're a part of. And that's one of the wisdoms that's come out of this experience I'm having. But um, one thing I didn't understand until um, this illness was that I'm deeply heartbroken that I live in this country doing these horrible things. And that five blocks away, there's an elder shut into an apartment building who has nothing to eat right now. And there's nothing I can do about that right now. And so I have to accept that. And that's something that I think um, that takes me back to my roots, my Christian, you know, African-American roots. It's like, we, we keep moving, we get by, but we have to acknowledge the heartbreak. And I, I owe that to our brother Thich Nhat Hanh for, um, 
reminded me of that. And the book is um, until it's at the, the book is at freedomvoices.org, freedomvoices.org, and it's until the streets of the hood flood with green. <laughs> Thank you for that, Kelly. It sounds Thank fabulous. Thank you. And I think that's a perfect example of a response, you know, to be inspired that Jody was inviting us to really imagine how we can take all of these pieces. It brings together this notion of what Vandana Shiva talked about in terms of how at the root of our food um, scarcity is really uh, the inversion of the war that ended up happening against food. So thank you so much for putting that out in the world. And um, Liliana, I think there's a question that perhaps uh, Angela Miles has in the Q&A that you might want to have Jody take a look at. Could you read that for us so that everyone can see it? Yes. Angela Miles says, how, how is it that information so important for all of us who care for peace that Mary and Jody and others have shared is not available generally in our free press? What is to be done? Uh, such a great question. Well, first of all, it's like, it's for all of us to share because the media serves, as Jen said, the oligarchs, the media. Um, I just did a, a webinar this last week on censorship because all the peace voices are being censored right now in the United States. And um, so it, it was a reminder that you know, in the United States, we have this thing called free press, but we don't have a free press when it's owned by the oligarchs. Uh, it only serves the war economy. The media serves the war economy. So you don't read about it in the media because it would it's the end of their system. We're, we're, we're revolutionaries. Just always see yourself as a revolutionary because we're not accepting the, the system that is given to us. We wanna transform the system and so we're revolutionaries and revolutionaries don't get to be uh, read about in, in the mainstream media because it's owned and operated by the oligarchs and they, you know, they're, they need their system to stay in place so they can continue to become richer. And, and um, so, yeah, that's not going to happen. And I, I did a webinar this week with three very, very different people. Um, um, Abby Martin, Chris Hedges, and Lee Camp, all three have been censored by the US government and they're big voices for peace and, and, and you know, anti-imperialism and anti-militarism and they've all three been censored. So um, they've, <laughs> they're finding their way uh, to new forms to be heard and I was raising up their voices. Um, it's at the Code Pink YouTube, you can find it there as um, this week's uh, censorship. Um, but it's a lot about, you know, uh, remembering, as I said way in the beginning of this, is turn the television off, do not pay attention to the news. It has nothing to tell you but a lie. And it is out there to break your heart, to uh, force you to hate, to uh, traumatize you, and to depress you so that you won't be engaged, so that you won't be cultivating the peace economy that would undermine this war economy and their wars. So, um, and that said, at Code Pink, we have a peace tank uh, where we talk all, all week. Uh, we, you can look at every week. Uh, we have an, another article we put out either to help make you smarter about the world you're living in and lied to about, or there's some amazing pieces by Kelly um, she's a genius, beautiful, heart, deep-hearted writer um, that you could look her up in our peace tank. She's met, written many beautiful pieces. And I put in the link, um, the chat, if you go back, um, both the um, petition we have for the peace, women peace activists in Russia that we're in contact with and feeding them all the signatures each week so that they know they're loved and supported here. Um, and also for uh, the Code Pink Peace Economy, where we're here to help you um, cultivate, have your practices, and um, where Kelly tells her more of her stories and where a lot of her writing is available. But, um, you know, write, tell your story. We are all the tuning forks, and it's up to each of us to share our stories um, as Kelly has shared hers and to be 
engaged in a way that you have a story to tell that inspires another. Thank you, Jody. Um, I want to just, I think this is, uh, this is such a good place for us to actually enter into this thought that uh, Luciana Perkovich has written. I think we're living now a sort of final acting out of Western patriarchal attitudes going on from five, from five millennia, but visible to everyone this time and in real time, as some of us have pointed out before. And together with the new reawakening of women and indigenous people all around the world makes the moment a real new portal for a shift in history. Love to all and many thanks for this opportunity to exchange hope and strength. Yes. And Thank Diane, you. Diane has put up a link to the Code Pink YouTube channel so that you can see um, the recording that Jody mentioned about censorship. And then of course there was a new, uh, uh, the most recent one, WTF is going on in South America, which I think we all actually need to take a look at. Um, and this is in a response to why isn't this important information getting out? Now you have a channel where you can see uh, and check on some very, very important information that we need to know. Well, and, and also just in the form of how do we respond, um, the, uh, the Summit of the Americas, which is the gathering of all the leadership of Latin America is going to be in Los Angeles in June. And we're doing a summit of the people to express the gifting peace economy in alternative to the violence um, and the war economy natures of um, the interactions of these governments. And I wanna say we have the support of the Mexican government and the Bolivian government. And so uh, in that offering of that the patriarchy is dying, um, the patriarch is dying because we're creating an alternative world and it's exposing that that's like you our work is nonviolent activism we are following in the footsteps of gandhi and and martin luther king in the sense that we are in model of the other and that makes you know the violent uh, economy uh, more visible and so just a reminder about that is it sometimes makes it uh, violent because the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off, um, as Gloria Steinem says. So always remember that when you are doing your peace work, that uh, it's like right now when I say we should have diplomacy and people want to scream at me, it's because, um, you know, like sometimes, the, you know, the, the truth isn't what people want to accept in the moment. But we give you lots of tools at Code Pink. We do teach-ins every week. If you ever want to plug into a tuning fork of truth, which we attempt very strongly to share and not share anything that we don't know, um, is, is uh, going to serve the hearts and minds of peace activists around the world. Um, so just modeling what I'm, I'm asking you to model, it's happening there. And again, just my deepest gratitude to Jen, for being a constant tuning fork for the world I wanna live in, for the world of gifting and sharing and love and of, of, of the abundant mother that is earth and is um, the feminist economy. Um, and to your the amazing team, Letitia and Liliana and Diana, and thank you and Judith, thank you so much for always holding us together in this space so that we can attune together. Thank you so much, Jody. Uh, um, we're getting to the top of the hour soon. And before we close, I really just wanted to thank all of our speakers, Starhawk who popped in in her very busy schedule, Vandana Shiva also, uh, Jody, of course, you make my job so easy this session and it's so appreciated. Kelly, on the ground in the United States, uh, giving us many solutions, both of you, Liliana and Judith, for making sure that we're uh, attending to our um, in the Zoom room 
people who have comments and questions. Uh, Elena and Diane, for your in the background support, Genevieve Vaughn and the International Feminists for the Gift Economy Network, and each of you who have attended with us today, I hope you will take a moment and remember that meditation. Diane has mentioned that perhaps um, I asked her if we could just take that little meditation and put it up as a clip along with the full video so that at any moment, any time that you feel the need to actually do a little extra visualization and protection of the Ukraine, that we can call on the words of Starhawk to get us there. Um, so please join us in two weeks, April 9th. We have uh, three other women, Mary Condren, who was with us today, uh, Angela Dolmich, who was with us today, and Susan Petrelli, we hope will be with us April the 9th for a salon that follows up. This is a very challenging time. And as women who are seeing alternatives and who desperately, and I mean that not in a place of uh, surrender or uh, less than orientation, but just the critical importance it is for us to actually gather and hear words of inspiration, hard truth telling so that we can have the courage to make choices that bring the maternal gift economy forward that uh, Jody has coined the phrase of the peace economy that we align again in the attunement for peace. Our recording, Diane has said, will be up tomorrow of this session at maternalgifteconomymovement.org so you can share it with your friends and other people who you might feel it's necessary for them to also be inspired. If you'd like to be notified of our upcoming salons and events, you need to actually sign up. I know it seems awkward, but you need to sign up at our website, maternalgifteconomy.org to get on our uh, MailChimp email notification list. We welcome your questions and comments, and we can put to you together with uh, our speakers. Uh, if you have direct questions for them, we'll make sure that we send them to them. The maternal gift economy at gmail.com. So thank you everyone for your attention. This has been full and wonderful. All of you who are our panelists and in the backstage, could you just um, put your cameras back on for a minute, unmute and say goodbye to our guests. And thank you everyone for all you're doing to create peace in this world Please stay safe, be well, remember to be kind to one another, and take really good care. Bye for now. Bye, everyone. Much love to you all. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much for putting this together. It's amazing. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Jody.